members, <laughs> but for those of you who aren't, we're a club of foreign correspondents started uh, 79 years ago by World War II correspondents, Americans who came home and wanted to have a, a club to be with their uh, cohort when they came home, and we're still going strong. So tonight, we're very happy to have Steve Call, governor and longtime member, and photographer who traveled together a while in, in Afghanistan. And um, Bob will run the program. And they'll, we'll talk for about half an hour or so and then have questions from the audience. So thank you very much. And, and particularly India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan as part of South Asia where we reported on myself for Time Magazine and Steve for the Washington Post. So we go back pre 9-11 and this fantastic new book, Director at S, The CIA and America's Secret Wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan, is uh, pretty much after 9-11 to 2016. Yeah. Uh, when you took the last photograph in the book. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> so between us, we have a few years there, uh, and it's still a mystery. No matter how many words or pages or photographs we, we put together, it, it evolves into uh, some clarity, and all of a sudden somebody kicks a stone, and back again we are to the mystery of that region. Uh, what I'd like to do, Steve, is uh, talk a little bit about Pakistan policy and personalities. I think personalities play a big role in the book. You've got some prime sources here. But first of all, what is Directorate S? And we've heard about ISI for decades. But even in Ghost Wars, Directorate S doesn't pop up. So. Uh, what it sort of does, but um, it's not the index. Okay, not by name. Um, thanks, Bob. First of all, let me say thanks for coming and thanks to OPC for having us. And Bob kind of underplays how long we've worked together. He was in Delhi for time as a photographer when I came out there for the Washington Post, and we did a lot of work together or alongside one another. We did a big Washington Post magazine cover story about Afghanistan after the Cold War in Kabul. That the cover photograph is still on the wall in my office. And then Bob and I traveled back to Afghanistan in 2016 to get the epilogue, went up to the Panjshir Valley and took some terrific photographs that are in the book. Um, so Director at S is the covert action arm of Inter-Services Intelligence. It's a, it's a name given by the Americans to an entity that's shadowy. It goes by different names, S-Wing, S. Um, it has cells in it that support Islamist militias um, who are fighting in Afghanistan, the Taliban being the most prominent, but also Kashmiri groups and other groups. It was well known to the Americans on September 11th because during the 1980s, which is sort of historian ghost wars, the United States collaborated with ISI and particularly with its covert action wing to provide guns and money to the Afghan Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. So when on September 11th, the Bush administration famously said to Pakistan, you're either with us or against us, and the then military leader of the country, Javez Musharraf, uh, flipped, he brought with him to the American side of the war coming against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda Inter-Services Directorate, uh, in Intelligence ISI, and its covert action wing. There's a scene in the book early on when the most famous leader of Director at S at the time, uh, you know, Colonel Imam, but has a longer actual uh, name, comes out of Afghanistan where he's been based to aid the Taliban into Kandahar. He rides on a plane with the CIA station chief up to Islamabad and he tells the CIA, oh, yeah, well, now we're totally on your side. And he gets off the plane and he goes over to the uh, home of the Taliban's ambassador to Pakistan, Mullah um, Zaif, and he 
greets him at the door and bursts into tears and says, I can't believe the treachery of us flipping to the American side and just sort of encapsulated in one day the ISI. They were capable of manipulating the CIA and the Taliban simultaneously. That was kind of their craft. And um, the other thing to say about it as a, as a subject in the book is that during the 1980s, um, ISI was built into a state within the Pakistani state because of the scale of American and Saudi subsidies, which were way out of line with anything ISI had known before or that the Pakistani defense bond budget could have accommodated before. So it, it was a swollen institution that had a certain hubris about itself. And then after the Americans left in the early 90s, ISI decided to apply the methodologies that it had piloted with the CIA against the Soviets to the Kashmir War. So they collaborated with Al Qaeda to train Kashmiri militants on the border of Afghanistan. And they began to think about the value of a long term asymmetric strategy against India that included these Islamist groups. So that led them back into partnership with the Taliban after the Taliban emerged in the 1990s. And they really were. Um, essential to the Taliban's control of Afghanistan on September 11th, when this book uh, begins. That's all Director at S. It's not just ISI and Director at S, but... Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of a, yeah, then now you're getting into kind of bureaucratic organization charts. I mean, we don't know a ton about exactly how these cells are going. I mean, I remember talking to an ISI officer during the course of the research for this book. You know, they're not easy to find, but they're not impossible to find. And I, he, a lot of ISI officers are career military officers who reach certain kinds of ranks, certainly up to brigadier, and who are then assigned into this, to this agency for maybe three years or six years. Some of them stay longer, but they're still in the military system. That's where their pension's going to come from. That's where their promotions are going to come from. And so I was saying to this uh, officer, what's the difference between working at ISI and working in the military? So the main difference is that you go into the office every day and you can see that there's a lot of activity up and down the hallway, but it's all compartmented. You have no idea who's doing what. Uh, so that's an essential problem of kind of describing the, the organization chart. But we do know that ISI has some functions that are very similar to other intelligence agencies. So they have uh, a directorate for logistics. So if you need a truck full of weapons, you know, on a Peshawar Street corner at night, there's a place you go and requisition that. And they have an administration directorate that takes care of everyone's salaries and pensions. And they have a communications arm. They have an intercept arm that cooperates with their military intercept arm. I think a lot of intelligence services, as I've come to understand around the world, you know, they, they more or less go to these uh, one by one method or another, they study each other's organization charts, and they often look very similar in the way that they set up their core um, in administration. And so where does Director at S fit? It's very much comparable to the paramilitary division of the CIA. I think it's a lot of ex-Special Forces characters who are out there to train and equip um, rough militias that might benefit from a little bit of professionalism on the battlefield. Um, that's certainly what happened with the Taliban. And they also then maybe resemble, um, besides Special Activities Division at CIA, you know, some of the uh, Directorate of Operations clandestine service of the CIA that works in rougher territory, Africa or other places where, you know, they, they may be operating under cover out of an embassy, so not out in the field, but their main job is to connect with clandestinely with, with militias and that sort of thing. So I think Americans who came into the basin of Pakistan, Afghanistan, really didn't understand what ISI was doing. A lot of people post 9-11, including journalists for that matter. Uh, and that was quite a challenge, I think, for people in the embassy. And please don't forget that the U.S. Embassy in Kabul was closed from 1989 to 2001, December. So there were no Americans on the ground. Yet ISI still functioned and geared up and trained and cycled out professionals that we really didn't have on the ground. So I, I, in the course of your reporting, did you find that a lot of Americans were just getting up to speed about ISI and then they'd rotate out 
there were some interesting characters in the book who came through, uh, Peter Lavoie and people right. that have n numerous years. And even Petraeus would say, we need officers to stay here five years. Who wants to sign up first? And I don't know how many people raised their hand, but he couldn't get that core of veterans that it takes a long time to understand this region. And I think the Americans continued to just not be able to trust themselves and also certainly not trust the Pakistani intelligence and the military. So this complicity and obfuscation is also a profession in South Asia and you almost need and a degree in it. Yeah, I mean, at the CIA too. I mean, no, I think it's, I think you're right. I, I think there's a phrase in the book someplace that there was maybe a basketball team's worth of people who really in the government and really understood uh, how Pakistan worked and who had the clearances to see all the information that were flowing that was flowing through Peter Lavoie was one. But I think the failure to understand ISI went through several phases um, in the US experience of the war that's still going on. So the first was um, immediately after September 11th. The only members of the Bush administration's cabinet that had personal experience of either Pakistan or Afghanistan were Colin Powell and Richard Armitage of the State Department, who had worked with Pakistan during the first Gulf War, Colin Powell, then in the military. So their whole vision of the region was distorted by their sense that the Pakistan army was the most important potential partner here. And, and they wanted to believe that Pervez Musharraf was sincere in flipping sides and abandoning the Taliban. The second phase was one of distraction caused primarily by the Iraq war, when the whole Bush administration after 2003 turned its attention uh, to a suddenly deteriorating. 2002 they started planning. 2002 they started planning, 2003 the main event, and then by 2004, 2005, as the Iraq war deteriorated, it became the, by far the number one priority in the Bush administration <coughs> to the extent that they turned security in Afghanistan over to NATO partners as a way to concentrate their forces and attention in Iraq. And so this is the period where I think ISI goes back into action. I think in the first year after the fall of the Taliban, Musharraf was cautious. He was willing to cooperate with CIA in capturing Al Qaeda and even some Taliban leaders turning them over, letting them be shipped off to Guantanamo. But by 2004, 2005, as the US turned Afghanistan over to Canada, the Dutch, the Pakistani read was, okay, we're already at the post-American moment. We knew this was coming, they come and go, now they're going again. And so we need to get back to managing our own security along this big Western frontier. And I think another factor in the Pakistani calculus was into or around this time, 2006, the US cut this huge nuclear deal with India, which we basically forgave India for breaking out of the non-proliferation system and offered them lots of civilian aid, but as importantly, legitimacy. And we said to the Pakistanis at the same time, you're not getting this deal because of your record of nuclear smuggling, which they have that record of nuclear smuggling. So uh, I think at the core command at that point, this, the conversation felt like you made yourself plain. India is your strategic partner for the 21st century. We're a transactional partner. You come and go. You leave us with the mess that you create. In this case, we had attacked Afghanistan and caused hundreds of Al-Qaeda members to flee into Pakistan, where they were already hooking up with local groups and starting to create havoc, eventually created a massive domestic insurgency in Pakistan against the Pakistani state. So there was no sentimentality in ISI. Ever. They were, they they were tapping them. into the communications of ISI with them. They were, they were listening to them. And then, so then, so then the next phase is they start to get a grip on what's going on. So the Taliban start coming back in Afghanistan. They start whacking the British in Helmand who thought they were coming in for a peacekeeping mission. Suddenly they're a full blown counterinsurgency for which they're not prepared. They start whacking the Canadians in Kandahar and Condoleezza Rice, who's I think probably the first in the Bush administration to get a grip on what's going on. She sends David Kilcullen and Elliot Cohen, a bunch of other people out to the war to study it. And Kilcullen comes back and he says, he's an ex-Australian army officer. And he comes back and he says, look, I mean, the Taliban units that are fighting the Canadians in Kandahar, they are sniping. That's not casual activity. 
They are wearing uniforms with insignia. They are maneuvering in the field. Um, that suggests you know, significant professional training. And, but think about it, 2006, this is not a message anybody in the Situation Room wants to hear. They are all Iraq all the time. And Iraq looks like it's going to you know, the bottom. <clears throat> and uh, so I would say by, you know, it was, it was not until, in other words, there was a blindness, some of it willful, some of it incidental to the Iraq distraction. By 2008, uh, the U.S. system had come to understand that ISI was on the other side of the world. But at that point, the question was, what are you really going to do about it? Because at that point, Pakistan was also falling apart. Benazir Bhutto has been assassinated. We have the Red Mosque. Actually, the Red Mosque. And you remember, you know, I always remind myself of that spring of 2009 when the Pakistani Taliban moved out of Swat into Bunair, and it looked like they were going to walk into Islamabad. You know, they were the 80 kilometers, kilometers away. Yeah. And, like, and it was such a panic. I mean, it was it was a, a moment when the nightmare scenario of a country with 100 plus nuclear weapons falling into the hands of radicals of unknown ambitions seemed, you know, not imminent, but not completely out of the question. And so there was a limit to how much pressure they were willing to put on the Pakistani state. At that point, the, the strategy was we should actually be rebuilding the Pakistani state so that we can regain some measure of security. So this deep state that is often in marks to how, how uh, Pakistan's foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan is, is described is to prevent India from encircling them from the, the eastern side and then over to the western side. Uh, but that's sort of, you know, Pakistan has a historical, it's almost a tradition to blame all other problems on India. When Karachi blows up, it, it must be Indian agents. And if Quetta blows up, it must be India supporting Baluch rebels being trained in Afghanistan. And in a sense, Pakistan is, is teetering uh, constantly in this period, I mean, domestically, that India doesn't really have to do much for Pakistan to shake. But I, I think uh, one thing we should mention is that a lot of military from the United States that went over to Afghanistan had never been there before. And they would ask me or Steve or other people, other journalists, what, what's going on here? And I said, well, in order to understand Afghanistan, you have to understand Pakistan. In order to understand Pakistan, you have to understand India. It's all tied together in, 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 in sort of the umbrella way that, uh, there, yes, it may seem like low-lying fruit, but uh, the intelligence agencies are uh, full of ambitious officers they have spent time in the military yet there has not been under the taliban really the new afghanistan didn't inherit an intelligence agency and i think you deal with um uh, a role and some characters from the Kabul side that have been suspicious about pakistan forever and if, if they do blame somebody they they will blame pakistan and there's probably some truth behind it um how did you, when you were reporting from the Afghan side, how uh, did their heart rate go up as, as their stories about Pakistan's subterfuge and complicity enter into uh, how you reported? Well, I mean, there's maybe two things. One is I did try to uh, understand the history of the Afghan intelligence service. Some of that ended up on the cutting room floor because even I recognized that I was uh, going nerd rogue with some of this material. But it's a very interesting story since we have an expert audience here. I'll give just a quick digest of it. You know, what was so interesting was that even with the Taliban, there was not that much discontinuity in the Afghan intelligence service. They, it started out as an instrument of the king to figure out what was going on in the provinces, and it all reported centralized into the palace. And it developed essentially as a mechanism of royal uh, control. And then uh, the Soviets came in, and it was remade in the image of the KGB, really hardcore. And then they they would recruit across ethnicities, but they tended to recruit from the ethnicities closest to the Soviet border. So Tajik and Uzbek, and they'd send these guys to Moscow and KGB Academy and, you know, whatever kind of electroshock therapy it is that they teach in their interrogation methods. And a lot of these guys came back and then they built uh, very large, I mean, huge tens of thousands of 
of employees in the Cod. We remember Khad, the main thing that would cause everyone in Afghanistan to quake. You just didn't want to end up in the Khad terrorification cell. That's K H A D. Yeah, and I mean, it sounds like something out of Mad Magazine, basically, but it was a horrifying institution and it was made in the image of the KGB. So then the Soviets leave. Massoud comes in as uh, Minister of Defense. Um, you know, uh, Marshal Fahim Khan is the head of intelligence. And he basically keeps a lot of these ex Khad guys who are in the right ethnic uh, pro profile in place. Then they're forced to flee, the Taliban come in, but they leave behind, like it's such a deep bureaucracy, literally hundreds of thousands of people. It combines the role of the CIA and the FBI. And so the Northern Alliance, as we came to know them, they had this intelligence service completely wired because it was all their cousins. It was all the people they'd left in place when the Taliban came in. So when the Taliban fell, there was this kind of KGB model Hot influenced, very Panjshiri influenced organization that was already there. So that was the main instrument of it. Okay, there. That was on the cutting room floor. <laughs> you have the outtakes. Uh, however, important. some of them did speak <laughs> Russian too. I mean, there was a legacy of that. Yes, and you ask on Rula Saleh, what? Tell me about your biography. And there's like, boom, there were three years I was in Morocco. <laughs> uh, so, anyway. To answer your question about how uh, the Afghan cabinet and security cabinet saw the Pakistan problem, I would say that in fairness to them, yes, it's an externalization of their own failures. Yes, it's a way of evading responsibility for corruption, failures of governance, factionalism, granted, stipulated. But, you know, as a kind of beat reporter on the war, I felt like I understood Hamid Karzai reasonably well, interviewed him, saw him at press conferences. But when I went back and excavated the details of his interactions with the Americans over a long period of time and tried to recount his, his meetings with Americans at critical points, it was striking how consistent he was. Every time an American would sit down with him, he would say, what are you doing about Pakistan? What are you doing about ISI? Do you not understand that this, our country is being destabilized by the infiltration and sanctuary that the Taliban are able to mount? And until you shut off that sanctuary, uh, we are going to be on the receiving end of a very violent they war. They did kill his father. They did kill his father. And and there was there's another scene where the Americans are going in with, you know, 100,000 troops. And the war strategy, the American war strategy, is to put them in Helmand, which contains 3% of the Afghan population, and then put them in Kandahar, okay, maybe more justifiable, but still in the heartland of, of um, Afghanistan. And Karzai's view is you should be putting 50,000 of those troops on the Afghan side of the Pakistan border and the other 50,000 on the Pakistan side of the Afghan border, and you should shut down this war. The Soviets came to the same conclusion, by the way, during the 1980s. They used Spetsnaz for that purpose. They thought they could get a hold of the infiltration routes. They never did. Um, so he wasn't irrational about his view of the of ISI or of the Pakistani war. Yes, it was... A, form of evasion of responsibility, but it was also um, a very specific set of eyes, of eyes on the war and accurate in a lot of ways. And what happened, I think, to him, apart from other reasons why he became estranged from the United States, a significant one was that he took for granted that the United States was the world's most powerful superpower and that if it wanted to stop ISI from supporting the Taliban, and destabilizing Afghanistan, killing American troops, killing NATO troops, but it could, but it didn't. So there must be another explanation, very South Asian way of thinking. And his explanation was that it was our intent to destabilize Afghanistan so we could justify a long-term troop presence there. And this really frustrated the Americans, this conspiracy theory, and they would come in and try to, to disabuse him of it. There was a scene where James James Dobbins, a late special envoy to the war, goes to see Karzai in 2013. He says to him, you know, Mr. President, by now you have all the Snowden materials. You have all the WikiLeaks cables. Can you see any trace of this design? And Karzai kind of half smiles and says, maybe you don't know the plan. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been on his meds. Well, which brings us to some more personalities. Um, there are many. 
and I, I would like to get to uh, some of some of the American involvement, people who, as journalists, you you would often in overseas positions find somebody who had spent time in the Peace Corps and then cycled through, came back as a professional having a baseline of language familiarity. And this one fellow I, that, whose name I brought up earlier, Peter Lavoy, had spent time studying in India. In 2004, he'd gone to the Naval War College in Monterey. He studied Urdu, and he was he spent time in the military. Um, Pentagon. Pentagon, but isn't we we seem at the end of your book, and it's it's fascinating view on the background of some of the, the participants, and some of whom live in New York right now, um, and many are scattered. But uh, even in the diplomatic corps, they don't have the deep base background to give them the familiarity. And a three dimensional chess is a, is a very complicated region and sometimes there uh crocker comes in from iraq and now you have in afghanistan you have the u.s ambassador who was in turkey prior to that which cycles through the empires and history um maybe you want to comment on the, the type of people you, you did come across who were so-called experts in the white house or advising yeah i had kind of two motivations uh one was to I mean, this book and Ghost Wars and other books I've done very much influenced and formed by the books I read in college that I put up on my shelf and said, you know, someday I'll do a book like that. And so those included like Bright Shining Live by Neil Sheehan about the, a certain generation of ex-foreign correspondent big books about Vietnam that were written by correspondents who had been out there but then came back and tried to put it all together. So Neil Sheehan's Bright Shining Live, Harry Halberstam's Best and the Brightest. Um, you know, Francie Fitzgerald's Fire in the Lake, a bunch of others, and then other big epic books like The Prize and so forth. And I could see that in the Halberstam in particular, but also in the Sheehan, that one of the devices for trying to bring forward the complexity, but also the dispiriting failure of the American experience in the war was to make characters of the experts, not to treat them unsympathetically, but to treat them empathetically but let the journey of their expertise kind of speak for itself and then kind of layer a lot of those stories of experts. And, and you know, these are wonderful people, well-motivated, genuinely expert. They had, as you say, like in Peter's case, like an experience of Pakistan before, long before 2001, when it was possible to travel and he'd lived with a family in the Punjab and spoke Urdu and, you know, there could hardly be someone in the American system who was more sympathetic to kind of the diversity of Pakistan or the potential of Pakistan. And yet, what does the American system do with that kind of expertise? You know, it kind of grinds it up and spits it out into some, it's like with that Sneetches machine in a Dr. Seuss book where it goes in a machine and comes out looking like something else completely different. And um, so the tragedy of that, of that expertise was also part of the motivation. It, it was a more practical thing that explains a lot of the characters of many others besides Peter who were in the book, which was you know, with a big story like this with a lot of layers and a lot of, I and mean, it's like Russian novel, the cast of characters is daunting if you look at it, but I try to use character to keep the story moving. And so I'm always looking for characters who I can latch on to and then take a trip through some form of complexity and through them humanize and make readable something that's you know complex and so the the glory of this particular project for the first time in my experience was that i was able to convert longtime sources into characters <laughs> <laughs> like basically go to them and say yeah i know i've been talking to you about this for 30 years and i know your name has never surfaced in anything i've done you want to be a character of this book come on <laughs> you are you're in the book you're in, i mean you're in the history you know you, i've got to write about you whether you want to talk to me or not you didn't have to use middle names <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah so that made it i mean that was one thing that made the book kind of come together was not just long experience but the fact that the people I was writing about, I didn't, in many cases, I didn't have to get to know uh, as a reporter. I already understood kind of where they fit, how they operated. And I think they understood where you had been writing 
I mean, Sangasar, where Mullah Omar had come from, not many people have been there. And I think even in the embassy in Langley, they were quite happy. Um, we should, um, I, I wanted to bring up the Saudi, Saudi Arabia's involvement, but I think we, we could be here for hours. Um, we should ask some questions. Uh, Take some questions from the audience, please feel free. This is, it, by the way, it, it's an amazing book, not just about the people, but the history that has gone by so quickly since 9-11. I'm Bill Holstein, I, I know most of you. I've covered the Soviet invasion. I was in Pakistan and Afghanistan both. So one of the mysteries that, that's haunted me all these years, I've never really been able to figure out, is that the ISI, I thought, was mostly Pashtun, the tribe. When, and Taliban also were Pashtun. So they were fellow tribesmen. So that the ruling elites in Pakistan were from the Punjab, or the, the military were Punjabis, the politicians were Sindhis. So there was a, a tribal connection between the ISI and the Taliban, it, it seemed to me. Uh, I, I've never been able to get a true understanding of that. But is, is this one reason why it's been so difficult for us to understand the complexities of? Of, the, of the, our policy in that part of the world that we're essentially dealing with a tribe that's trying to defend itself on both sides of the Durand line. Yeah, I mean, I think directionally there's there's something there. I mean, the, the thing is that the Pakistan army, let's say the general officer class, so four star down to brigadier, um, they're about 20% Pashtun and 80% Punjabi. And I'm not aware of any Pashtun officer who's been the chief of the army staff or risen, risen too high in the army. So it's um, it's prim primarily a Punjabi institution. Um, any Pashtuns will tell you that mm -hmm. there are occasional three-star Pashtun officers who are very important. But it's hard to explain it by analogy. But I mean, the Punjabis are the dominant ethnic group in Pakistan. The Pashtuns are the second. Uh, most important ethnic group and very much present along the Afghan border and as you say connected by history language and sometimes uh, <clears throat> tribes with the Taliban so the Punjabi strategy has been to keep control of the institution and the strategy mostly um, while contracting with Pashtun colleagues and officers to handle the Taliban on the front lines because of the obvious advantage they have of seeming to be brethren. Um, and so um, the other complexity you allude to about the Duran line, so you know the Pashtuns are a distinct ethnic group, they have a distinct language, they have a distinct history, they have a very strong sense of themselves as a national group they're a little bit like the Kurds that way, maybe not so explicitly seeking a state right now, but every now and then flirting with the idea. And two-thirds of them live on the Pakistani side of the border. One-third of them live on the Afghan side of the border. Yet on the Afghan side, they constitute 50% of the country's population. So you can see from Pakistan's point of view, I mean, this is really complicated territory for them. And the Punjabis are always very nervous about being in Pashtun country. So for a long time, they felt that they should follow the British model, which was to essentially see this as Indian country, push subsidies and guns up there, stay out, use political officers to occasionally do some light administration, but this it would never be territory that Punjabi, Punjabi dominated army could ever conquer or occupy. Now that's changed. I mean, they're up there now in a big way. They went into South Waziristan, they went into North Waziristan. They thought that they would pay a huge price, um, and now they've established themselves up there. So, I mean, the, the last thing I would say is that in the relationship between the Frontier Corps, ISI, Directorate S, Pashto-speaking officers, and the Taliban, there's always been a very complicated combination of mutual identification, sympathy, mutual I ideological um, uh, radicalization and cynical Pakistani state policy. Both are there at the same time. And that anecdote about Colonel Imam is a pretty good example of how it works. Um, the Pakistanis, and you can see this in current Pashtun popular resistance to the state of Pakistan, 
civil civil kind of disobedience and campaigning. The capacity of the Pakistani elite to project hubris to ordinary Pashtuns along the border is seemingly limitless, even if it's self-defeating. And you know the Pashtuns don't miss that; they they, they get it, and so it's a very ambivalent relationship. Another question. Uh, Albert Golson, I'm a member of the uh, OPC. Um, you know, can you explain a little bit more with, um, I believe it's um, Kilcullen, he was, uh, uh, I believe, an Australian Special Forces. He's written a number of books, including Out of the Mountains. Um, to what extent did he put forth any recommendations on how best to um, deal in that region? Yeah, he. He did a couple of different tours of study that he brought back to Washington. The first one, I think he was not sure what he was seeing, but he was a little bit uh, leaning toward the idea that ISI was fully back in action. The book describes how he goes into Islamabad as the first part of his tour, and then, um, you know, he's a representative of Condoleezza Rice, Musharraf still in power. They want to give him a first class. Tour. They often did this. You'd fly in a helicopter up to Waziristan, and then you'd get a very embedded in the Pakistani army experience of Waziristan. <clears throat> so he goes up and he does that tour and comes back to us. He goes down into South Waziristan where the Pakistani army was hunkered down at this point, more or less on bases, surrounded by a local Taliban that they really couldn't influence very well. And he comes back to Islamabad and he meets the CIA station chief who says, Let me pick. Uh, play a tape recording that we just got in of your Frontier Corps escort on your drive through South Waziristan. And it's basically the Pakistani Frontier Corps calling Al Qaeda saying, the American is going to be in your valley tomorrow at 11 o'clock if you want to kidnap him. <laughs> so uh, that was like a signal that maybe this uh, with us or against us thing was a little more complicated. Then he went back a year later, and that was when after going around Afghanistan and seeing what NATO troops were dealing with tactically on the battlefield that he came back and said, um, you know, this is not like light support. This is military organization of a clandestine paramilitary type. This is, you know, sniping and insignia and all the rest. And he describes bringing that into the strategy reviews toward the end of the Bush administration and essentially taking a very blunt position that ISI is on the other side of the war and finding that that was an extremely unpopular position, even in the late Bush administration, because it was highly inconvenient. It was embarrassing because they had invested so much in Musharraf and to recognize that in some sense they've been had uh, was a very obviously a very difficult thing to digest. I think by the end, the very end of the Bush administration, the president was willing to say, I quote him, saying in his last visit to Kabul, visiting with Hamid Karzai, that he says, you know, I have to say last thing about ISI, you were right. And he did authorize, you know, a much more aggressive posture in the summer of 2008. But it's really the summer of 2008. It takes all the way to the summer of 2008. And they were probably back in action in a serious way for about two years by the time the Americans really came to grips with it. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Qasim Shah. I'm, I was born in Lahore, uh, so I, I have the vantage point of having lived in both countries, in the U.S. as well as Pakistan. Uh, so, I mean, last year the U.S. and Pakistan celebrated uh, 70 years of diplomatic uh, relations. Uh, the U.S. has a big embassy in Islamabad, which has about two baseball fields, as well as three counselors in Karachi. Lahore and Peshawar. Um, it was uh, in the 1960s that uh, Jackie Kennedy traveled to Pakistan and she was enamored by a horse at the horse and cattle show in Lahore. And she had the horse uh, flown from Lahore into the US. And that horse was only a riderless horse at uh, JFK's funeral, who led the, that horse led the procession for the funeral. So, I mean, the US Pakistan relation, uh, for obvious reasons, goes back a long way. Um, for the last uh, 16 years, uh, 
Uh, I mean, all the U.S. supplies into Afghanistan have been going through Pakistan. Uh, the Pakistan is shut off the supply lines for about 12 months or 11 months after 26 Pakistanis were uh, killed in an airstrike at the border. And now the Pakistanis are uh, fencing the border uh, with Afghanistan. Uh, and in addition, one other factor is uh, one of the factors that the Trump, Mr. Trump, uh, tweeted that the U.S. has given 33 billion dollars of aid to Pakistan since 2001. If you look at the U.S. aid website, the total amount dispersed, including military amount, is 15 billion dollars. So, uh, do you think that uh, it's a bit unfortunate uh, that? Uh, Pakistan is treated like a bogeyman in the press over here in the U.S. press, and uh, the facts are somewhere in in the middle, in between. I'm just curious about your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I do think the Pakistani perspective is um, missing from a lot of American thinking and the legitimate experience of Pakistan as a as an ally of the United States that isn't a very constant ally that can't seem to make up its mind about what it wants in the relationship that goes from close embrace to sanctioning that, um, um, you know, is, is, as with the coalition support funds, seems to signal to the Pakistanis that we, our idea of a friendship is one where we buy your activity and not uh, one where we work on your long-term kind of strategic concerns. The book describes efforts to get over that history of mistrust and transactions, particularly during 2010, when there was a strategic dialogue about what would it take to actually do this differently? What would we have to do for you and what would you have to do for us? And it was moving along. It didn't quite answer those two fundamental questions fully, but it was making progress. Um, Ashfaq Kayani, who was then the chief of army staff, wrote a paper that's referred to in the book as Kayani 3.0. And he laid out pretty honestly and answered the question, here's what you'd have to do for us, for us to think about you differently, and for us to think about ISI and the Taliban differently. And, you know, the Americans read his paper and they're like, wow, that is, uh, that is a big ask. <laughs> There's a lot that you want from us that we may not be able to deliver, but let's talk about it. And they just started on that kind of discussion when you know, the Raymond Davis episode happened, and then you know, Osama bin Laden's killed at Abbottabad, and uh, Shamblala, which you referred to, happens at the end of the year, and the, it was like the anisariblis of U.S. Pakistani relations, and the whole relationship kind of shattered, went back to the posture of mutual mistrust. I was talking about this with somebody earlier today. I mean, part of it from the American perspective was a structural problem, which was the greatest number of Americans in the region by far during the period between 2004 and 2013 were in Afghanistan. And every day they you know, listened to Afghans who were frustrated by Pakistan's interference in their country. And many of them served you know, as colonels or as brigadiers or as two stars in combat in Afghanistan against the Taliban. And they could see very well for themselves that the Taliban were coming over the border from Pakistan, that they were retreating back over the border to Pakistan. They were refitting there. They were, they were you know, obtaining medical care there. Um, and they were killing comrades. You know, after a certain number of ramp ceremonies, you, you, emotion sets in. And it became a disproportionately Afghan-centric experience. There wasn't any comparable experience of, for example, Pakistan's horrors with its own domestic insurgents or its own domestic terrorism. And that was a small group of people in the embassy who understood how that went. So, um, you know, I take your point. I'd say one last thing. The U.S.-Pakistani relationship, as you say, has been going on for a long time, and it has always undulated between cooperation and understanding and estrangement and sanctions. And I think that's probably likely to go on for a while. Right now, under pressure, Pakistan is sort of nesting inside its relationship with China, which is a very comfortable place to be, considering how big China is in the world compared to when Pakistan and China first became allies. But Pakistan has, as any independent state would, always tried to balance its relationship with China with a relationship, a healthy relationship with the United States. That gives Pakistan a little bit more independence, a little more freedom of movement, some options. 
And when you think about the next 20 or 30 years, let's you know, set aside the, the you know, instability of the Trump administration. It's not obvious to me, if I were a Pakistani nationalist, I would not want to be China's most important client, uh, essentially a prisoner of that relationship as China becomes whatever China is going to become. I would want some independence of action. I would want other allies besides China. So I think Pakistan will think that way and gradually look for opportunities, as small states do in a world of great powers, to balance their relationships with big countries, including us. Well, it's time now, I think, uh, for you to look at some books, if you can. Uh, Steve would stay around to sign them, of course, and thank you all for coming. Uh, you can see how it, it's difficult to get to all the topics that we had thought about in the beginning, but uh, thank you again for coming. It's very interesting. Well done, Steve.